SpaceX fired up the engines of its space-bound Starship prototype Thursday afternoon, September 8th, in a dramatic test that also set some of the surrounding landscape ablaze. All six of the Raptor engines on SpaceX's Ship 24 vehicle blazed briefly Thursday at 5.30 p.m. EDT at Starbase, the company's South Texas facility. This appears to be a successful test. SpaceX then announced Ship 24 completes six-engine static fire test at Starbase. This static fire test marked another step toward launch for Ship 24, which is slated to conduct the Starship program's first ever orbital test flight in the coming months. Although the static fire lasted just a few seconds, a grass fire broke out immediately afterward and is still burning on the south side of Texas Highway 4. It is believed that plastic and other materials ejected from the launch pad are the sources of ignition. The local fire department was out as a safety precaution. Honestly, take a look at this picture. The fire is not very easy to fight without local support. Additionally, many heat tiles on the ship have been falling down due to the immense vibration produced during the static fire. Zach Golden on Twitter said almost 30 damaged or missing tiles on Ship 24 after a six-engine static fire test that lasted for eight seconds. In reply to this tweet, Elon Musk said, Yup, there is a reason we do static fires. Much better to break things on the ground than en route to orbit. Thermal protection tiles are key to a spacecraft surviving re-entry. During re-entry, a spacecraft will gain a massive amount of heat, converting the velocity of the vehicle to heat through friction with the air. There are a few ways to deal with that heat. An ablative heat shield will heat up and burn away, carrying away the energy. The problem with ablative heat shields is that they burn up and need to be replaced. That doesn't work if you want to relaunch a spacecraft within an hour of landing, as SpaceX eventually will with Starship. In order to eventually allow quick reusability, Starship instead uses ceramic thermal protection tiles to insulate the spacecraft from the heat of re-entry. The tiles, like those of the space shuttle, are extremely lightweight and fragile. Each Starship has roughly 25,000 thermal protection tiles, and production of these tiles is not quick. SpaceX makes use of a heat shield bakery in Cocoa Beach, Florida, and will begin producing tiles at Starbase. The current tiles and attachment systems seem prone to cracking and falling off, which won't work if Starship 24 and future Starships are to survive re-entry. SpaceX will need to figure out how to reliably produce more robust thermal tiles and mount them if SpaceX is to fully kit out multiple Starships. SpaceX seems to be doing just that. A slight color variation in the tiles is due to SpaceX experimenting with production. But aside from Ship 24, Booster 7 completed a spin prime test with several Raptor engines at 12.15pm Central Daylight Savings Time. In fact, that was a pretty amazing spin prime test, the biggest one Super Heavy Booster has ever done. But that's about it. Back to our static fire test, the biggest question now is whether Ship 24 is ready for its first orbital flight. Almost 10 months ago, Starship 20, SpaceX's first potentially orbital class Starship prototype, began static fire testing in a somewhat similar way. Its first day of static fires began with a single Raptor vacuum engine and ended with a simultaneous RVAC and sea level Raptor test in October of 2021. In some ways, SpaceX has been a bit less cautious with Starship 24, which is the second potentially orbital class prototype to begin proof testing. Ship 24 already has all six Raptors installed, whereas Ship 20 only had four of the six engines installed during its first static fire tests. SpaceX also took about three weeks to progress from Ship 20's first static fire to its first static fire of all six engines, whereas it appears that Ship 24 could potentially attempt its first six-engine test just a few days to a week from now. On the other hand, Ship 24's path to its first static fire was substantially longer than Ship 20's. Ship 20 completed its first static fire test, or tests, just 25 days after its first proof test, referring to the process of verifying that the prototype was in good working order before moving on to riskier testing with flammable propellant and intentional ignitions. Ship 20 also completed its first six-engine static fire 46 days after testing began. Ship 24, meanwhile, took 75 days to go from its first proof test to its first static fire, 
almost three times slower than Ship 20, a prototype that was essentially the first of its kind. It's possible that Ship 24's upgraded Raptor 2 engines are partially or fully to blame. Instead of jumping straight into hot Raptor testing like Ship 20, which began that particular campaign with a partial ignition pre-burner test, SpaceX put Ship 24 through seven spin prime tests before its first static fire. Regardless, SpaceX has finally crossed that particular Rubicon, and with any luck, Raptor 2 testing can soon end on Ship 24, and then Ship 24 will definitely finish all tasks earlier than Booster 7. In other news, NASA targets late September for the next Artemis 1 launch attempt. But a lot has to go right. Reflect upcoming work to remove and replace seals on two liquid hydrogen lines that connect to the SLS core stage and then perform a tanking test at Launch Complex 39B to confirm that the repairs eliminated leaks seen during the two earlier launch attempts. They also avoid planned use of the deep space network needed for communications with the Orion spacecraft for the impact of NASA's DART spacecraft with a moon orbiting the asteroid Didymos on September 26th. That schedule depends first on completing work on the liquid hydrogen lines. Crews were at the pad replacing the seal on the quick disconnect fitting for one liquid hydrogen line, 20 centimeters in diameter, as well as a separate line 10 centimeters in diameter that run from ground systems to the core stage of the SLS. Both seals could be replaced by the end of the day if the weather does not interfere with work on the pad. Once the seals are replaced and the lines reconnected, NASA will begin preparations for a tanking test, tentatively scheduled for September 17th. In that test, the agency will fill both the core stage and the upper stage of the SLS with liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen to verify the performance of the seals. While the rocket will be fully loaded with fuel, NASA does not plan to conduct a formal wet dress rehearsal as it did four times in April and June. Engineers are still investigating what caused the leak in the larger liquid hydrogen line that led to the September 3rd scrub. Mike Bulger, NASA Exploration Ground Systems Program Manager, said there was evidence of a small notch on that seal that will be studied more closely. He added that it was also not yet clear if an inadvertent overpressurization of that liquid hydrogen line during preparations to begin fueling caused the leak. Should NASA get approval to proceed with a launch later this month, the September 23rd launch window opens at 6.47 a.m. Eastern and lasts for two hours, and would result in a short class mission that would end with an Orion splashdown October 18th. The September 27th launch window opens at 11.37 a.m. Eastern and runs for 70 minutes, and would allow for a long class mission ending November 5th. It finally happened! Booster 7 has just become the most powerful active rocket in the world, firing up a record 14 of its 33 Raptor engines. And I've gotta say, it's been worth the several month long wait. Just absolutely amazing. This is one big step closer to making history because during this test, SpaceX used the full nitrogen and water suppression system on the pad, providing a crucial data point on the quality of this vital safety system at the pad. But according to some sources, concrete chunks were falling to the ground shortly after the test. This was around 40% of the total power output. A mix of debris types also fell during the test. While a bit unnerving, it is a big deal. Powered by 33 upgraded Raptor 2 engines that SpaceX says can produce up to 230 tons each, Super Heavy could have produced up to 3,220 tons of thrust when it ignited 14 of its engines earlier today. That likely means that Starship is now the fourth most powerful rocket ever tested, slotting in above NASA's space shuttle but below the Soviet inertia. And even if all 14 engines never throttled above 73%, SpaceX's Starship booster likely still produced more thrust than any other active rocket in the world, beating Falcon Heavy, which is mind-blowing. Notably, only 14 out of 33 engines were tested, yet we got a dust cloud engulfing the entire launch tower. In fact, that is not dust. That is pulverized concrete or concrete fire spalling. And that is a problem. Let's go back in time to November of 2020, when the rocket company SpaceX was just starting to make some progress in the Starship testing program. One of the prototypes, serial number eight, was on the pad to test fire the engines for the very first time as a fully stacked vehicle. 
Almost as soon as the engine lit up, it was clear that something was wrong. A shower of sparks exploded into the dusky sky, and the engine abruptly stopped. The sparks looked innocuous at a distance without a reference for scale, but in reality, they consisted of massive glowing chunks of the launch pad below the rocket. One of these chunks was blasted into the engine bay, severing an essential cable and severely damaging the rocket. The event brought into the spotlight what is probably the most humble piece of engineering in the entire rocket industry, the pad. Indeed, when a launch or landing pad fails, it can be worse than if it wasn't there at all, creating high-speed projectiles that jeopardize the safety of the vehicle and its support equipment, not to mention its crew. In preparation for the latest test of B-7, SpaceX teams had installed shielding on the orbital launch mount legs and also tested the fire suppression system. These static fires are as much to test stage zero as the booster. Luckily, nothing caught fire. Starship Gazer took some pictures of the orbital launch mount after the epic 14-engine static fire, and it also looks fine. However, as mentioned before, there are visible things that got blasted away. Let's imagine when they do a 33-engine test. I fear this thing is going to either carve a hole in the ground or many engines would fail. Hopefully, the SpaceX team can control this. They are building up for an eventual 33-engine static fire and ultimately an orbital flight test target it for this December. While Starship has just won its prestigious crown, if NASA has its way, Starship could hold it for less than 36 hours. This is because, as early as 1.04 a.m. EDT or 6.04 UTC on November 16th, a little over 35 hours after SpaceX's record-breaking Starship static fire, NASA will attempt to launch its massive Space Launch System rocket for the third time since late August. And as the saying goes, third time's the charm. Hopefully. In any case, mission managers met on Monday, November 14th, to discuss the flight readiness of the Artemis 1 Space Launch System rocket and Orion spacecraft following slight damage caused by Hurricane Nicole, which was swiftly downgraded to a tropical storm after making landfall on Thursday, November 10th. Despite the fact that a band of insulating caulking on Orion was damaged by high winds during the storm's landfall, Mike Serafin, Artemis mission manager at NASA headquarters in Washington, said, There is no change in our plan to attempt to launch on the 16th, during a media teleconference on November 14th. The unanimous recommendation for the team was that we were in a good position to go ahead and proceed with a launch countdown, added Jeremy Parsons, deputy manager of NASA's Exploration Ground Systems Program at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Now, the launch team will begin pumping 750,000 gallons of super cold liquid oxygen and hydrogen fuel back into the huge rocket's tanks starting just before 4 p.m. Tuesday using revised Kindler Gentler techniques to control temperatures and minimize sharp pressure jumps to prevent leaks in critical seals. And if any problems do show up, engineers will have two hours to resolve them before the launch window closes. But the weather is 90% go, and if the fueling procedures work as intended, the 322-foot-tall Space Launch System rocket's four shuttle main engines and extended strap-on solid fuel boosters should finally roar to life at 1.04 a.m. Wednesday, opening a new era in American spaceflight. Briefly turning night into day as it climbs away atop 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust, the 5.7 million pound SLS will quickly accelerate as it consumes propellants and loses weight, passing through the speed of sound in less than a minute. This will overtake Super Heavy B-7, but also make it the second most powerful launch vehicle in the history of spaceflight after the Soviet N-1. N-1 never succeeded, however, so SLS could become the most powerful rocket ever to reach orbit if its first launch is successful. Meanwhile, the two strap-on boosters, which provide the lion's share of the rocket's initial thrust, will burn out and fall away about 2 minutes and 10 seconds after liftoff. The four hydrogen-fueled engines powering the core stage will shut down six minutes later, putting the Orion capsule and the SLS second stage into an initial elliptical orbit. After raising the low point of the orbit, the single engine powering the interim cryogenic propulsion stage, or ICPS, will fire again about 90 minutes after launch to break out of Earth orbit and head for the moon. The Orion capsule and its service module will separate a few minutes later to continue the rest of the 
trip on their own. The goal of the Artemis 1 mission is to send the Orion spacecraft on a looping trajectory beyond the moon in a critical test of the vehicle's propulsion, navigation, and solar power systems before returning to Earth for a 5,000 degree re-entry and splash down in the Pacific West of San Diego. Pop quiz, 5,000 degrees F or C? Write your answer in the comment section down below. Now, if the Artemis 1 flight goes well, NASA plans to launch four astronauts atop a second SLS for a lunar shakedown mission, Artemis 2, in late 2024, followed by an astronaut landing mission in the 2025 to 26 timeframe. But that assumes the Artemis 1 flight goes well. As Jim Free, director of exploration systems at NASA headquarters, put it Friday, we're never going to get Artemis 2 if Artemis 1 isn't successful. Very eloquently put, Mr. Free. On Tuesday, SpaceX test-fired its super heavy rocket for about 12 seconds, making it the longest duration firing of the massive booster so far. Besides testing the super heavy and Raptor 2 capabilities, the static fire also tested the durability of the SpaceX Stage 0. After the previous test, SpaceX upgraded the Starbase launch tower and launch pad. Sadly, the result did not reflect the changes, as there are still concrete problems. During a static fire test on November 29th at its South Texas facility, SpaceX ignited multiple Raptor engines on Booster 7. The static fire occurred at 2.42 p.m. Eastern and lasted for 13 seconds. The test was a powerful one, suggesting it involved a healthy proportion of Booster 7's 33 Raptors. That turned out to be the case as shortly after the test, SpaceX confirmed via Twitter that Booster 7 lit up 11 of its engines. SpaceX's CEO Elon Musk also said via Twitter that the test is a little more progress to Mars. SpaceX fired 14 Raptor engines on this booster for a few seconds, so Tuesday's test did not set a new record regarding the number of engines tested. However, this long duration firing is the longest period of time that so many Raptor engines have been fired at once. This is the main goal of this test. Besides the excellent operation of 11 Raptor 2s, the important thing is that we still see debris raining down. Go ahead and as you watch, pay really close attention for the few seconds that matter here. Hey, you see that? See that? Seriously, SpaceX really struggles with concrete, it seems. Indeed, the last test of 14 engines witnessed the concrete beneath the orbital launch mount blasting off and raining down due to the intense heat and pressure from the engine exhaust. After that, SpaceX reinforced the concrete to prevent damage during future tests and launches. The company uses highly resistant and long-lasting Fondag concrete to protect the floor beneath the pad from the engine exhaust. Fondag, F-O-N-D-A-G, is pre-blended, high-strength, heat-resistant concrete designed for heavy industrial applications. Fondag is a pure calcium aluminate concrete that contains both calcium aluminate cement and calcium aluminate aggregates. The aggregates within Fondag are actually composed of the same clinker from which Lafarge grinds the calcium aluminate cement. When Fondag hydrates, there is not only a physical bond between cement and aggregate, there's also a chemical bond. The aggregates within Fondag are very hard, dense, and non-porous. This combination of physical and chemical bonds between cement and aggregate produces a superior concrete capable of withstanding the toughest combinations of thermal cycling, high heat, severe abrasion, mechanical shock, and corrosion. Fondag is extremely stable at high temperatures and in conditions of severe thermal cycling from negative 184 degrees centigrade to 1093 degrees centigrade. In the same conditions, Portland cement-based concrete becomes unstable and experiences mechanical and structural failure. With this upgrade, the latest test doesn't feel like the torrential downpour of tiny rocks we saw before. I'd say this concrete held up a bit better, if not much better. But it's certainly not perfect, as we can see. Remember, this time uses a smaller number of engines, and the ultimate goal of SpaceX is three times this. So, after analyzing the obtained data, SpaceX definitely needs more systems to support the launch pad for a safe Starship flight in the future. But given the current situation, Musk's goal won't come to fruition anytime soon. Indeed, the path to orbit for SpaceX and its Starship launch system is still unclear. Previously, SpaceX founder Elon Musk said the next step was to fire a subset of Super Heavy's engines for about 20 seconds to test autogenous pressurization. This method of pressurizing fuel tanks uses gases generated on board the rocket rather than a separately loaded and inert gas such as helium. 
Tuesday's test may have been a slightly shorter version of this autogenous pressurization test, which only took 12 seconds instead of 20, or it may have been something else. The company is taking an iterative design and development approach to the Starship vehicle and its super heavy first stage, so its test plans are fluid not unlike the rocket's cryogenic propellants. In all likelihood, SpaceX still has a couple of key tests to complete before the combined Super Heavy rocket and Starship upper stage are launched from the company's Starbase facility in South Texas. It's anticipated that SpaceX will conduct at least a short duration test firing of all 33 Raptor engines simultaneously to gain confidence in the totality of the complex plumbing to fuel and pressurize the rocket's propulsion system. Then, the Starship's upper stage will be stacked on top of Super Heavy, and the combined vehicles must complete a wet dress rehearsal. What does seem clear is that SpaceX is maturing its approach to working with the Starship architecture. After completing all of its technical preparations, SpaceX must also obtain a launch license from the Federal Aviation Administration, which is in progress but has yet to be completed. While it remains theoretically possible that Starship will make its orbital launch attempt in December, there is an increasing likelihood that the test flight will slip into the early part of 2023. In the end, whatever happens, will happen, so let's wait a little while longer. Meanwhile, in China, after years of trying in space, the country has six astronauts aboard its recently completed space station for the first time, following the arrival of three crew members aboard Shenzhou 15. The Shenzhou 15 crew will be sustained by supplies delivered to Tiangong aboard the Tianzhou 5 cargo mission launched on November 11th, Easter. The Tiangong space station now consists of three roughly 22-ton modules in a 393 by 386 kilometer orbit. The 13.5-ton Tianzhou 5 cargo spacecraft and two roughly 8.2-ton Shenzhou spacecraft are docked with it. The Shenzhou 14 crew is expected to return to Earth in early December. The first crew rotation marks the start of science operations on Tiangong, which carries 24 experiment cabinets and a payload airlock. China aims to keep the orbital outpost constantly occupied and operational in orbit for at least 10 years. China will begin to send international experiments to the station through an initiative with UNOOSA in the near future. It's expected that Tiangong will outlast the aging International Space Station and could become the only permanent crewed outpost in orbit. The arrival of Shenzhou 15 at Tiangong signifies the completion of plans approved back in 1992 to develop human spaceflight capabilities and build a space station. The Tiangong itself could also be expanded from three to six modules, according to Chinese space officials. Such an expansion may depend upon other countries joining the effort. The Suntian Optical Module, a co-orbiting Hubble-class space survey telescope with a 2-meter aperture and 2.5 gigapixel camera, is planned to join Tiangong in orbit in late 2023 or early 2024. The decision to embark on a space station program was taken back when the country's economy represented around 2% of the global economy and seeking a foothold in the international launch market. China has since become the world's second largest economy behind the United States and achieved a number of in space, including a Mars rover landing, a lunar far-side landing, building its Beidou GNSS constellation, and more. The country is also moving forward with a robotic lunar exploration program with the goal of building a lunar base in the vicinity of the South Pole of the Moon in the 2030s. This pathway is designed to converge with human spaceflight experience gained from Tiangong and the development of new, large rockets to allow China to send astronauts to the International Lunar Research Station. A roar of an explosion ripped through SpaceX's rocket testing facility in Boca Chica, Texas. The incident began around 4.20 p.m. CDT when Super Heavy Booster 7, or its launch mount, unintentionally ignited a cloud of flammable gas produced during a flow test involving most, if not all, of its 33 Raptor engines. When the resulting cloud of well-mixed methane and oxygen gas was accidentally ignited, it functioned like a small fuel-air bomb, rapidly combusting to produce a violent explosion and shockwave. After the initial explosion, the fire also expanded to burn as much of the resulting gas as possible, producing a fireball that briefly reached 80 to 90 meters in height. Flames burst from the engines and an explosion sounded in the air, shaking the cameras that were recording the test from a distance. 
CEO Elon Musk, apparently not directly participating in the test, initially stated that the explosion and fire were planned, implying it was more or less a nominal outcome. Yes, booster engine testing, he said. But others weren't convinced the fireball was meant to happen. I'm probably wrong, but surely ignition was not planned with those lifts right by the pad and such, NASA Spaceflight's Michael Baylor tweeted. To preserve the safety of the few local residents still living at Boca Chica Village, SpaceX is required to issue printed safety warnings well in advance of Starship tests that could create a shockwave capable of shattering glass and injuring locals. SpaceX has never intentionally performed such a test without distributing those warnings and did not distribute a warning before July 11th, all but guaranteeing that no ignition event was planned. A few hours later, Musk deleted his original tweet and posted a different one, confirming that the explosion was actually not good and that SpaceX is assessing the damage. He also explained, Cryogenic fuel is an added challenge as it evaporates to create fuel air explosion risk in a partially oxygen atmosphere like Earth. That said, we have a lot of sensors to detect this. More later. For the most part, Booster 7 and the Starbase Orbital Launch Site exceeded viewers' expectations of their sturdiness, exhibiting very little off-nominal behavior after being subjected to an unexpected explosion, shockwave, and fire. Immediately after the event, B-7 quickly depressurized its propellant tanks and appeared to have left the vents open, reducing the chances of the booster destroying itself if SpaceX were to lose control. SpaceX also appeared to initially avoid using the orbital launch mount's umbilical mechanism to remove propellant from the Super Heavy's tanks, perhaps concerned that the shockwave might have weakened its connection to B-7. About an hour after the explosion, B-7 dumped a large amount of cryogenic liquid out of a new vent located on its aft end, producing a flood that spread around the adjacent pad. It's unclear if that liquid was nitrogen or oxygen, but either way, the emergency propellant dump appeared to cause a fire to start about 30 meters from the booster and launch mount. The fire proceeded to burn intermittently for the next two hours, all the while posing a clear and present danger to the rest of the pad and booster if it were to spread in the wrong direction or breached the wrong underground pipe. Thank goodness SpaceX got lucky and the fire eventually self-extinguished. Despite that, the fate of B-7 is still unclear. It's likely that B-7 experienced some sort of damage during the explosion, whether it be to the dozens of Raptor engines or the booster itself. Most likely both. But SpaceX will still need to fix or replace the booster and determine the cause of the anomaly. But of course, we can't rule out the possibility that SpaceX will let B-7 retire amongst its brethren in the Starbase Rocket Garden. In addition, it's also not clear if the incident damaged the launch mount, which is equipped with a pair of mechanical arms known as chopsticks, when we spotted some unknown objects dropping from them in the explosion. Regardless, SpaceX will need to figure out what exactly caused this explosion and make sure that failure mode does not appear again. As a little bit of luck, based on the crazy production and assembly rate at SpaceX, Musk still has some backup options. Typically, B-8 was fully stacked in High Bay a few days ago. The vehicle is also a contender to perform the first orbital flight test of the Starship Super Heavy system, and it now is perfectly capable of replacing the B-7. However, it's worth noting that Monday's test was one of many that the rocket booster must complete successfully in order to fly safely. This is far from the first fiery explosion at SpaceX's South Texas facilities, which are intended for early rocket prototype testing. And although the FAA did not immediately respond to a request for comment asking if they will investigate the apparent explosion, as Reuters space reporter Joey Roulette tweeted, Whoop, this might delay Starship's first orbital flight a smidge. But now let's move on to something more uplifting. As a piece of amazing news, President Biden just unveiled the first full-color image to come from the James Webb Space Telescope. The image shows a galaxy cluster called SMACS0723, which is about 4.5 billion light-years away. The cluster acts as a gravitational lens, bringing into view far more distant galaxies, some of which appear in the image as arcs. As NASA Administrator Bill Nelson said, we're looking back more than 13 billion years. The NASA statement accompanying the image release didn't give specifics on the more distant galaxies visible in the image, which involved 12 and a half hours of images taken at several wavelengths. 
The Big Bang took place an estimated 13.8 billion years ago, meaning those distant galaxies date back to when the universe was less than a billion years old. The detail in the image comes from a very tiny part of the sky. If you held a grain of sand on the tip of your finger at arm's length, that is the part of the universe you're seeing. Just one little speck of the universe, Nelson said. Biden appeared pleased by what he saw and by the performance of JWST. It symbolizes the relentless spirits of American ingenuity and it shows what we can achieve, what more we can discover. These images are going to remind the world that America can do big things. This telescope is one of humanity's great engineering achievements, added Vice President Kamala Harris. Both she and Biden emphasized the role of international cooperation in JWST's development, including how, according to Harris, a scientific endeavor can build upon the international rules and norms that govern our cooperation in space. Scientists and others also were immediately impressed with the image. According to Macarena Garcia Marin, an ESA instrument scientist for a mid-infrared instrument on JWST, also known as MIRI, in an ESA statement, this is just a first glimpse of what Webb can do. While we are truly in awe today of Webb's first deep field, I can't help but think of what images and science results are just around the corner in the many years to come. The deep field image was originally scheduled to be released today with other early release observations. In other words, a new era of seeing deeper into the universe than ever before has begun. And that's about it for today's episode. Don't forget to share your ideas in the comment section down below. Everyone's support motivates us to create more quality content just like this. So for that, we thank you so much, and we hope to see you again next time.